we borrowed for everything. Want a new couch? Go finance it. Want a new TV? Go finance it. Want a new car? Go finance it. My whole philosophy was credit cards. I'll just work another week. <laughs> swipe the car. Everything kind of started to crash. We started to see our marriage drop away. I personally owed $750,000 in debt. I was totally hopeless. You need to decide if you want to be wealthy or if you want to look wealthy. When somebody told me about FPU, I grabbed hold of it like a life preserver. It gave me hope that we could make our marriage work. Knowing where your money's going is a huge life changer. Nobody owns me anymore. Nobody. It's opened up communication big time. All of a sudden, we were back together on a crusade. We changed our family tree. I'm here to do my debt-free screen. Yeah, how much have you paid off? 456000 89000 $124,000. Three, two, one. <laughs> this financial peace stuff is working. People are getting out of debt, and they're becoming millionaires. We are the first generation that are millionaires. And we've given more than we ever imagined we could yeah. give. I now have a net worth of $1.7 million. Hope is real. February 26 begins the next greenhouse session. Praise the Lord for Dave Ramsey and Financial Peace University. Okay, should be on. Good morning. How's everybody doing? A little cold this morning. You know, I, I fold this paper, and so you have to kind of flatten it out, you know, when you take it out so it works right. That's kind of like me when it's cold. When I'm in the car, I kind of have to unfold when I open the door. It takes a little bit, two or three steps before I'm kind of moving the way that I usually move. Well, I hope everybody's doing well this morning. We have been having some pretty strange weather. We actually had an interesting thing happen at our house last night. I drove in from a ceremony I went to. A friend of mine, Major Jason Ross, he works at North Greenville University. He became the upstate commander of 2nd Battalion of the State Guard. And so they had a changing of the command yesterday, which is very, it's a very moving service. The lieutenant governor was there, and I'm just, I'm very proud to be Jason's friend and to be a colleague of him. But anyway, when I got back from that, Denise came out. Usually I drive up in the garage, you know, and I get out and go in. Well, Denise came out to meet me, which I knew something was wrong. But the lights inside the house were flickering, and you would, like if you looked at the the heat pump the thermostats we've got one in the front of the house one in the back and it was flashing and the heat wasn't good so we couldn't figure out what in the world turns out finally got we got cpw to come out there and they came out pretty quick we're on cpw over in greer and it turns out that the main lines coming into the house only had 60 volts coming in 30 on one side and 30 on the other and that's not enough to do much except being an aggravation. So they actually said, well, we're going to fix it, but you need to be careful. And I said, well, define be careful. He said, well, we're going to run a line from the power source all the way across your yard and just hook it up and let it lay in the yard. So you want to keep your children away from it, and you probably shouldn't mess with it much either. I said, no, you're right. I'm not going to be getting anywhere near it. What I know about electricity is when it's up, it's on, and when it's down, it's off, and that's about it. <coughs> so I'm going to stay clear, but they're supposed to come and fix that this week. That'll be interesting. All right, Psalm 139, if you'd turn there with me today. We're going to talk about a subject that for some reason people think is controversial. In fact, there are those who would say that I'm going to be political today. That I'm going to talk about a political issue, and politics, don't don't, they don't belong in the pulpit. So, Pastor, why are you talking about these things that are political? Well, here's my answer to that. The sanctity of life was long before it was a political issue. It was a biblical issue and an issue near to the heart of God. So, it isn't God's word that has politicized 
this issue. It is the culture that has taken a concept of the sanctity of life and turned it into a political issue by passing laws that challenge that concept of life's precious nature or its sanctity. And so I think it's a perfectly good topic for us to look at biblically, especially in a world where this is something, yes, it is something that when we, when we step into the public arena, we're going to have discussions about life because they're out there. But as followers of Jesus Christ and believers in God's word, we of all people should be able to discuss it from a biblical perspective, but also from a historical perspective. So we're going to look at a little bit of that today. If you'd stand with me, we're going to read Psalm 139. It's probably a, a very familiar passage, but it begins, we're going to begin in verse 13 and go through verse 16, only three verses today. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Thank you. You can be seated. So it comes down to this. This is the question. Are we somebodies or nobodies? That's the real question that we face when we talk about abortion because the answer to that question, whether we're somebodies or nobodies, is going to determine our attitude toward life in general. If we are, as some people claim, simply the result of an accidental combination of chemicals that happened to be electrified by some natural phenomenon at just the right moment, and we climbed out of the primordial slime as a single cell entity, and eventually we were able to develop limbs and the capacity to think and the ability to move. If that's the way we came into the world, then yes, life has no value beyond the chemical value that we find within the body. And by the way, our chemical makeup it's worth about $4.50. I'm trying to give your ego a boost today. If you take away the possibility of eternity, if you take away the possibility that we're created in the image of God and that we mean something beyond our physical makeup, we're worth about what you can get. You could go to five below and buy a person for $4.50 because we are chemicals and we're about 60 to 65 percent water and maybe that explains all those trips that I have to make between midnight and five o'clock in the morning I don't I don't know but we are about 60 percent 65 percent water plus some miscellaneous trace elements and all the minerals that we can talk about maybe some of you remember now in the next service I'll have to explain the Beatles okay in this, in this service, I don't have, hopefully I don't have to explain the Beatles. You know who the Beatles are. They had a song, and I, by the way, I'm a Beatles fan. I'm unashamed. I, I like the Beatles music. I'm, I'm more of an early Beatles than a Sgt. Pepper's Beatles, but I, I'm okay with pretty much with all of it. But maybe you remember this song from the 1960s. Here, here's, here's just some of the lyrics. He's a real nowhere man sitting in his nowhere land making all his nowhere plans for nobody. Doesn't have a point of view, knows not where he's going to. Maybe he's a bit like you and me. Now that, that pretty much encapsulates this idea of people being nobodies. If that's true, we're just the current occupants of the top of the food chain. You know, the reason that we're, we survive and the reason that we build cities and the reason that we build roads and the reason that we build commerce and we make things is because we're at the top of the food chain and if we were ever to lose that position there would be something else pop up there and take our place in fact there are ethicists today who say that the world would be a better place and that the best way to get rid of climate change is for human beings to be kicked out of our place as the top of the food chain I don't know about you, but I like being number one. Because when you're number two, you're on somebody's menu. So it, I think it's better that, and, and there's not just, a, not just the reason that we happen to be the current occupants, 
but it would be true that we're just merely the current occupants if we're nowhere people or nowhere nobodies simply here by some type of cosmic accident now I want to do a quick historical review of what happens when people are determined to be nobodies instead of somebody and I'm only gonna go back to 1857 to start we could start a long way back from that we could go back to the Roman Empire and the way people were treated particularly women we could go all the way back to the beginning of civilization but let's go back to 1857 to a Supreme Court decision called Dred Scott in that decision black people were declared to be non persons by the United States Supreme Court it was determined that they didn't have any inherent rights it was determined that they could be owned by other people it was also determined that abolitionists that is those who believed that this was terrible were not supposed to be able to impose their views on the rest of society and slavery was pretty much ensconced in the legal world and it was said that this is okay now what is the result what happened as a result of that well millions of people were in the bondage of slavery 620,000 people died in the American Civil War as we had a big discussion over this question and it really and, and look I'm I'm a garden variety historian and I from time to time I'll have people come up to me and they'll say you know preacher people who think that the Civil War was about slavery are wrong it was about states rights and it was about states rights but it was about the state's rights to own slaves so it's kind of hard to get away from it no matter how you frame it and 620,000 people had to die before we began to move away from this idea that for a little while was ensconced in the United States Supreme Court and determined to be the law of the land now let's fast forward a little bit let's go to 1933 and Nazi Germany because when Adolf Hitler came to power within a few years the Jews were considered to be non persons in fact their property was confiscated they were herded into ghettos and if that wasn't enough then later on Hitler came up with what was known as the final solution we call it the Holocaust he herded the Jewish people into death camps like Auschwitz and Treblinka and over six million Jews died because they were considered to be non persons and thousands hundreds of thousands of people died in World War II in fact worldwide it was over a million people died as a result of World War II because at least in part the Nazis had determined that a group of people were non persons now let's fast forward to January 22nd 1973 because on that date seven out of nine Supreme Court justices declared that a woman's right to privacy superseded a baby's right to live in the mother's womb what was the result of that decision well preborn or unborn babies were declared to be non persons they were declared to be the property of their mothers pro-life advocates were told that their opinion or their understanding of life could not be imposed on the rest of the country and abortion was upheld on demand as the law of the land well what's been the result since 1973 62 million abortions have been performed how many is that per year I'm glad you ask that's 1,319,148 per year or 3,614 a day or 151 per hour or just over two per minute and that would be 302 abortions performed while we're in church this morning now when we throw out numbers like that you know, you know sometimes when numbers get so big they kind of get out from under us don't they I mean we you, you it's hard for us to wrap our brain around that many 62 million of anything so let me give you just a little bit of perspective 62 million 
is more than three times the combined populations of Los Angeles, Dallas, San Francisco, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Detroit, St. Louis, Seattle, Seattle, and Denver. How many of you have been to a Clemson game? Death Valley, yeah. How about Gamecock? Have you been to Columbia, to Williams Bryce? That number, in order to see it, you would have to fill either Clemson or Williams Bryce 700 times to get a picture of what that number looks like. And so sometimes it helps us to put things into that kind of perspective. Now, there have been ripple effects from the decision in 1973, Roe versus Wade. For example, right now, California, Colorado, Hawaii, Montana, Maine, New Jersey, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington, along with the District of Columbia, it is legal to have doctor-assisted suicide. So the precious nature of life. See, it didn't take long for it to migrate from the womb all the way to the point of death. And so once you begin to acknowledge that we're nobodies instead of somebodies, then life becomes up for grabs. It becomes up for debate as to, as to how precious it is and who gets to make the decision about life and death. RDU, RDU 486 and other abortive patients are available now, so you can chemical abor abortions are, are very much available in our, in our country. January 22nd, 2019, which ironically was the anniversary, the 47th, I believe, anniversary of Roe versus Wade, the state of New York passed a law that would allow abortion, abortion up to the moment of birth. And yet, most people would say, if you poll Americans, only a very small percentage of people believe that there should be late term, that is, third trimester abortions. But in New York, it's up to the very moment of birth. And there's a website, and please let me recommend that you don't look at it. But I want you to be aware of it. It's called Shout Your Abortion. And what it is, is a website dedicated to women who brag and shout and celebrate the fact that they've had multiple abortions. And it's one of the most horrifying things that you've ever seen if you believe what the Bible says about life. Speaking of that, what does the Bible say about it? Well, let's look at the scripture from today. Look at verse 13. It says, we were formed. Notice the word is right there. For you, speaking of God, this is the psalmist saying to God, you formed me in my mother's womb. God was intimately involved in creating human beings. Now, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that when he called mammals and fish and vertebrates and invertebrates and all types of living and creeping and flying things, God just spoke and they came into existence. How cool would that be? Would that not be great if you could just speak something into existence? I mean, I have to drive through the drive through at Dairy Queen to get a Butterfinger blizzard. But if I could just, if I could just speak a Butterfinger blizzard into existence, I'd weigh 600 pounds, but it'd be kind of cool to have that ability. But God does that. God, the nature of God is, as creator, he calls things out of nothing into something. But even with all of that creative power, when it came time to create you and me, when it came time to create human beings, he acted very differently. Listen to Genesis 1.27 combined with Genesis 2.7. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Let me ask you a question. Does that sound impersonal to you? Does that sound random? The creator of the universe, who all, in order to get everything that we know, the stars, I was reading the other day in my quiet time, that God named the stars. 
he knows the names of all the stars. I mean, the ones that we've discovered, we, we name them. But, but we could be wrong because God knows where those stars are. He put them there. It's hard for us to comprehend. But the God who did all of that, when it came time to create us, he formed us with his own hands. He breathed into us the very breath of life. He poured into us his image. He stooped and we became a living being. You know, there's only two times when God has stooped down to the earth. Wants to create and wants to redeem. Because he came to the earth in the form of his son Jesus and died on the cross. So our creation and our redemption are the two things that God has most intimately been involved in. We were formed by the hand of God. The Hebrew word for the phrase, my inward parts, is kill y'all. And it means mind. In other words, God formed our minds to relate to him. Verse 13 says we were woven, which is better translated covered in our mother's womb. And you know why the word, the, the Hebrew word for woven can be translated either way is because it carries both meanings. So think about this. While God was weaving us, he was watching over us. While he weaved us in our mother's womb, he was intimately knowledgeable about our existence. See, sometimes I think we treat pregnancy as just being one of the biological facts of life. It's actually a miracle. God says it's a miracle because God is at work. He's weaving, watching, protecting. Can you imagine what happens when abortion happens? When the, what God is weaving and protecting, if you saw the movie Unplanned, you know what that looks like. It's, it was graphic. That that which God is weaving and watching over suddenly is gone. And it's life. God made us different from the rest of creation. We carry his image. We're filled with his breath of life. He's given us a soul, which means we were created for eternity. The very first command God gave Adam, do you remember what it was? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. The very first command comes under question when we take human life for granted. Because we can't be fruitful and multiply if the fruit of the womb is up for debate as to its value, as to what it really is. You know, ironically, you can go back and look this up. This is crazy. I, I, I double-checked this because some of this stuff gets printed and you never know. But the year before Roe versus Wade became law, Congress passed the Bald Eagle Act, and it made it a crime punishable by, I think it's $50,000, no, excuse me, $500,000 fine plus a five-year prison sentence if you destroy a bald eagle egg. $500,000, five years in prison. But at least now in the state of New York, an abortion, the taking of a human life, is possible up until the moment of birth. Now, God says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at verse 14. I love those words, fearfully and wonderfully. Let's take a look at them in reverse order. Because the human body is an amazing creation. And you know what fascinates me? David wasn't a doctor, he was a king. David didn't understand microbiology. David didn't know that every living creature is made up of microscopic cells that are so small that 30 to 40,000 of them can be contained in the letter O on a page. That's how, that's how, wonderful, how, how wonderful life is, how miraculous. Microbiology tells us that every cell contains 200 trillion atoms and that each one has its own specified timetable that tells it when to grow, when to divide, even when to die. By the way, microbiology says that a single cell is so complicated, so complex, a single human cell has little machines that know exactly where to ferry material from one side or the other, and none of this can be seen without electron microscope, something so sophisticated. Before we invented, before the invention of the light electron microscope in the 1950s, we looked at a single cell 
And as Michael Behe said, it looked like a black blob of plasma, just a, a, something you couldn't see through. But once we were able to see inside the human cell, we saw levels of complexity that could not possibly be random because it's so incredibly efficient in how a single cell works. David didn't know about the circulatory system. He didn't know about the human brain that's capable of handling millions of bits of information per second. He couldn't possibly know any of those things, and yet by the witness of the Holy Spirit, he said, we are wonderfully made and my no, my soul knows it very well god reveals to us how wonderfully made we are how much more living in the world of microbiology should we understand being wonderfully made and what that looks like now the hebrew word for fearfully means to be made in reverence so in other words when god created us he gave us listen to this the capacity to love the ability to know right from wrong. We were fearfully made for good works in Christ Jesus. You know, we've been going through the book of Ephesians, and this is what we learn. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. How much awe and reverence should we express in our lives when we realize that we've been created by God in Christ for the purpose of glorifying him in our lives now the bible says in verse 15 through the first part of verse 16 it says specifically not only are we fearfully and wonderfully made but our frame is seen by god and by the way before i get away from wonderfully made you know in our family we've never had trouble having babies i mean denise and i had three and there could have been a lot more but three is where we felt like we were and so we have three children right now we have six grandchildren and we have one on the way and the one that's on the way is very very special let me tell you why because two years ago we learned about the heartbreak and the sorrow of miscarriage that's a word that if you've experienced it my heart goes out to you like never before it's my youngest daughter now i love all my young I'll, i love all my children i love my son and my my oldest daughter and my young, i mean i love them all but you know what's interesting when you look at our family adam is kind of our oldest son he's kind of a mixture of denise and me together and you can see both of us expressed in his personality but in our oldest daughter, sometimes when I'm riding with her in the car, she'll say something to me, and I'll look at her and go, okay, Denise. She's Denise made over. I mean, she sounds like her, talks like her, thinks like her. It's crazy. When you get to Allison, Allison is mini-me. She's my clone. She's the life of the party. She's the one that wants to be in front of people all the time. She loves life. She loves doing stuff that's kind of outside the box. And, and she and I just have this as, as our, our youngest daughter. I don't know. It's a daddy-daughter thing that goes on with daddies and girls anyway. But when she was having miscarriages, and she had three, three, She's almost six months now. I talked to her this morning because I asked permission to tell this story. I didn't want to tell it without her knowing. But when I was talking to her on the phone this morning, she said, I called her at 7.30. And she said, yeah, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my phone. I said, I know what you're doing. It's what I do when I'm in bed. I said, but she was laying there, and Josh, her husband, was, was, had his hand on her stomach because, because the baby's moving around. And that just, because I sat across from her at a restaurant one night, took her out for a daddy-daughter date when she was in the middle of having these miscarriages. And I looked at her, and I, I prayed for her, and we talked about it, and it broke my heart. Because can I just tell you what daddies do? Daddies fix things for their daughters. And I couldn't fix this. 
so, so hurtful. And I know you know this. I would pray that God would take any pain that comes on my children and let me have it. And I couldn't take the pain from her, and I couldn't fix the problem. But we have a God who is faithful and loving, and he's blessed her. And here we are in the sixth month, and Hayes is strong and healthy, and I pray every day that it'll be that way. But here's the thing that I can't understand. When I think about how wonderfully made we are, I remember when I saw the ultrasound of Hayes when she reached that point. See, the, apparently the point, I'm learning all this because I knew nothing about miscarriages. We had never experienced that. That point where about the 12th, the 13th week is kind of the critical point. And I remember when Allison passed that with Hayes and we got to the point that we got, we got to see the ultrasound and there she was. When you look inside the womb, and we have the ability to do that now at such an early time, how people can look at that and not think what David said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Great is your work, O God. But as we said, not only that, but our frame is seen by God. When I think of verse 15 and the first part of verse 16, I immediately think of Paul's question in Romans, what can separate me from the love of God? Look at, look at what it says in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Jeremiah put it this way. He said, before I formed you in the womb, God said, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nation. You know, when the stress of the world comes at me at warp speed with phasers and photon torpedoes flying and me without a force field, I like to sit down and remember what God has said about me. It's not all about me, but it is good to know that my Father, who created me, created me in such a way He formed me, He made me skillfully, He's poured into me a purpose for this life and it's a purpose that will extend into eternity that life is more than just what we have on this earth he loves me and his purpose for me doesn't change and this is where i want to talk about people maybe who have had an abortion god's plan for you has not changed we still have you still have a future and a hope Emotional and physical healing begins when we turn to God in the truth. You know, that's the wonderful thing about God. We can go far afield. We can believe things that we're told by the world and embrace them and fall into a pattern of sin in our lives. But the minute we acknowledge the truth and come back to Him, there's reconciliation, forgiveness, and an opportunity for us to get up and keep moving in His love and His grace. And his plan and purpose for us is not thwarted because God never refuses to forgive and restore when our hearts are broken over the things that break the heart of God. All sin needs to be covered by the blood through confession so it can be put where? In the sea of forgetfulness. That's a beautiful thought. My sin not in part but the whole, has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. This is the goodness of God, how God works in our lives. We conform to the death of Jesus by humbling ourselves and confessing our sins. We celebrate his resurrection by being forgiven and being reconciled to God through Christ skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. My eyes have seen, your eyes rather, have seen my unformed substance. Now, you know what's interesting? You know where we get the, the word embryo? It's from this word in the Hebrew. The word that means unformed substance is a word that we've adopted that means embryo when we talk about an embryo in formation. 
There are those who would have us believe that we're haphazardly made with no purpose. God says we are skillfully and carefully made with a purpose and a plan that stretches throughout our entire life. And that gives us meaning. And then the fourth thing I want you to say is, see is that we have a future. All of our days are under the care of God. There are those who say that only the mother's future is to be considered. But I would say that this unborn baby is more than just a clump of cells that has the potential for life. Unborn babies, according to God, are alive. And they already have the blessing of God. They already have a purpose that God has given them. This is, how, this is part of God's will. Every life conceived is more than a potential life. A conception is a life with potential. And you know what's interesting about that? The Hebrew word for ordained means shaped as a potter shaped as a potter. Now that kind of takes us back to the beginning where we see God lovingly fashioning our life with a purpose, with his hands. Paul affirms this in Acts chapter 17. He said, God who made the world and all things in it, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. God orders our steps. He directs our path. He has set the appointed times and the boundaries of our lives. Can I sum that up for you? We are somebody's to God. We're not nowhere men sitting in our nowhere land making all our nowhere plans for nobody. From the beginning, from the moment we were conceived, we were created, fashioned, breathed into, and ensouled by a holy God that orders our steps. We are human beings with a future and a hope. You know, today medical science decides when life begins and ends. Do you know what the criteria is? Primarily, a heartbeat, and brain waves. Now, it used to be kind of easy to say that life doesn't exist until you get to a certain month. The thing is, the more medical science advances, the closer we get to conception to be able to say medically, scientifically, what we know scripturally and spiritually that this is life. Because at six weeks, there's a detectable heartbeat. At eight to 10 weeks, there are brain waves. Most women don't know they're pregnant, but the time life medically has already been established. Even if you don't believe it spiritually, medically, if you go by medical science, if you say, well, I'm not sure about the Bible. I don't know that God was really talking about that. Well, what about what we know about the nature of life, the test that's used by those in the medical profession? The criteria is met when we know that pregnancy is happening. University professor Dr. Chris Gabbard used to believe that some human beings should be allowed or even encouraged to die. In fact, he works with an ethicist at Princeton University, Peter Singer. I don't know if you've ever heard of Peter Singer, but he's actually advocated for the right for parents to have an abortion up to 30 days after the baby is born. And I've just seen the reaction on some of your faces. You didn't have a clue. But there's actually a debate that goes on about that. Viability, it, even, it, it is now, with some ethicist, it has extended to the 30-day period. And you know, it, it, we would say, we hear that and we say, oh, come on, preacher, you know that would never happen. I just challenge you to think about the things, the list of things in your mind, rifle through them that you said would never happen before we think this is one of them. But that's the debate. But his colleague, Dr. Gabbard, he grew up prizing intellectual aptitude. He detested poor mental functioning. So he adopted an ethical stand 
that said society has the right to exclude people who are not persons. Singer and Gabbard believe that severely disabled people should either be killed or allowed to die. This, this they advocated for, openly. But the birth of Gabbard's son radically changed his viewpoint. During childbirth, Gabbard says his son experienced permanent brain damage, and today he's, he's a blind quadriplegic with cerebral palsy. Gabbard writes movingly about the first time he saw his newborn son in the intensive care unit. Now remember, this is a guy who agrees with the ethicist that says maybe up to 30 days, but certainly for disabled people, life should be able to be brought to an end. Listen to what Gabbard says. I was deeply ambivalent, having been persuaded by Peter Singer's advocacy of infanticide, but there was my son, asleep, on a ventilator, motionless under a heat light, tubes and wires everywhere, monitors alongside his steel and transparent plastic crib. But what stirred me most was the way that he looked like me. Nothing had prepared me for this shock of recogni recognition because when I looked at him, I saw the baby boy that was in my own baby pictures when I was an infant. Today, Dr. Chris Gabbard is an advocate for the dignity of the severely disabled. After pointing to a 2010 Gallup poll that says nearly half of Americans, 46% in 2010, supported assisted suicide, Gabbard wrote these words, Many such well-meaning people would like to end my son's suffering, but they do not stop to consider whether he is actually suffering. At times he is uncomfortable, yes, but the only real pain here seems to be the pain of those who can't bear the thought that people like my son exist. Look, I know this is controversial. I had friends of mine, I had people tell me, now, you're going you gonna to talk about this? You're going to get up and talk about abortion? You're going to get into politics in the pulpit? And my response was, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what God has said about the nature of human beings, about the quality of life, about what it means. You know, it kind of transcends arguments about when life begins because life begins at the moment God begins the weaving process in the womb and that's at the moment of conception he's weaving and watching and as we move forward life eventually comes to fruition and you know because I believe in God and I believe in eternity I know that one day <clears throat> I'm gonna have prayerfully seven grandchildren but I actually have 10, and three of them are already in the presence of the Lord. And one day I'll get to meet them. Because God says that life is precious and eternal and in his control. And I thank God for that. Let's stand together. We're not going to have a traditional invitation this morning. We're just going to close with a word of prayer. But what I do want to say is this. If you've been touched in some way by abortion and you would like for me to pray with you, I would like to. I would like to talk to you and lift up a prayer. If God is speaking to you about this issue and there's something in your life that needs to be dealt with, I don't want you to come forward this morning. I want you to come to one of us on the staff and I want you to pray with us. And I want us to be able to sit down with you and spend some time loving on you and sharing what God's Word has to say. And I want to encourage you today. Yes, life has become a political issue. Take your Christian beliefs. Take what the Bible says when you go into the public arena and stand for what God has declared to be precious. That's what I would encourage you. Not because it's the political thing to do, but because it's the biblical thing to do according to his word. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had to be together this morning. Thank you for speaking through me on this important issue. Help us, Lord, as we go from here to celebrate.
the beautiful gift of life that you have given. And Lord, help us to be those who are willing to stand and to be able to say to a world that doesn't understand the nature of life, to be able to speak from the scripture that you have fearfully and wonderfully made us. In Jesus' name.